So welcome to the fourth uh, European talk show. Again today we have assembled to have a discussion respectfully, factually and diverse. And uh, we have met here in Brussels and our host is the AIDS IEM Caring Convention. And we have with us uh, more than 30 people from over 12 uh, countries. So quite an international group. Our subject today is United Europe, a playground for youth. And we have prepared a set of questions uh, by the participants of this convention and we want to discuss now with um, three experts I have uh, gathered around me, um, which are experts on European affairs, if I may say, uh, what those questions um, can mean and how we can actually respond to them uh, when we are sitting in the classrooms uh, with the students. So let me introduce, um, first of all, um, Kasia. Um, Kasia is Head of Policy Advocacy at Concord, uh, a European Confederation of Relief and Development NGOs, and uh, with member organization at 28 national associations, 23 international organizations, and uh, in total, I think, representing more than 2,600 NGOs. So uh, Concord sees itself as an, uh, as the word was interlocutor, is that like interface? Is that the main person to talk to for the, uh, between the European institutions and, po and development policy. Uh, before Concord, uh, Kasia worked for um, uh, Brussels-based NGOs and she has designed and coordinated uh, several successful public affairs campaigns. So then let me move on to Ilona. Ilona is the director of the Public Libraries 2020 program. Uh, the program uh, gathers 65,000 public libraries across the European Union and is run by the Writing and uh, Reading and Writing Foundation. She, manage, she manages the Brussels team, the advisory group and other strategic relationships within the program and is responsible for strategic guidance and management. Previously, Iluna served as the Secretary General of Culture Action Europe, a European umbrella association promoting arts and cultural associations across Europe. And with that, I come to our third guest, uh, Ivo. Ivo is the policy officer at the European Commission and part of the Brexit negotiation team. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Before that, he was uh, working at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, Bulgaria, as an advisor for the Bulgarian presidency of the Council uh, of uh, the European Union. Um, and with that, I think we can start our questions and I would like to invite our first um, participant from the convention to ask his question. Take your seat and uh, if you don't remember your question, here it is. <laughs> so the question is, why, uh, where would you like to live and why? So if we consider that question to be asked to a group of 16, 17, 18 years old, um, what will get in, in their mind? What would you think? I think uh, the, the thing to remember with, uh, with this age group is that they'll think about family, friends, etc. So I think it will be, uh, the first reaction will be to kind of think about what if they say, well, here, uh, and that, that will be, I guess, a first reaction from, uh, from people. Uh, and then the other comment I had shortly on this is that I see the question is open-ended. Uh, and if they say Brazil or China or someplace outside Europe, there is a little bit of a chance that the discussion goes into a slightly different direction that you're, you're thinking of. So uh, this is kind of my initial reaction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think in that age people start thinking about university and where would they like to study as well. So it also can shape the question in the way that they will tell you where they see themselves in a few years when, when they go, actually when they leave home. So it can be their, their, their home country, they can be abroad. It can be very broad, but I think at this point people also start exploring a different ways and different views and what they want. I don't necessarily think that they would tell you that they want to live somewhere in the European Union, but they may say like, oh, I would like to be an engineer and maybe the Germany has a better program for, for engineering, so I want to go study in Germany because of that. You know, maybe you could narrow it down, maybe you could even focus on travel 
or visit or and perhaps even specify within the EU mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to avoid now the, now the question is certainly um, in the group again something where they do not um, look to you know the bigger discussions we have in Europe uh, and I find it actually recently quite interesting to see that the migration within the European Union is far bigger than the migration coming from Arabian or African countries. I think we have seen a, a migration from east to west of the European Union of more than 10 million people in the last years. In light of that, how should a discussion like that be actually held with a young person? I mean, we had a discussion today about Macedonia and we had the same statement. What was it? I guess it was every week 200 people leave Macedonia. Was it a week? A month. A month? So how should such a question actually be uh, discussed with young people? How to make them confident that their life has a perspective, but at the same time, there also is uh, some contribution to the environment they're living in right now? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, yes, I, I, think, I think the main aim of the question would be to, to open the, the mind of, of, of people. I mean, it's true that a lot of them probably will never have thought of moving abroad and, and will be thinking more about your family and friends. And then maybe it might be useful to have examples, uh, show them that it happens, that uh, it's, it's possible, and it, it can lead to, to uh, different uh, debates on different topics like, like migration. So that, um, well, I, th I think that might be uh, one of the... I think with the migration it's interesting because we think, I would consider, I'm not 16 year old, but I would consider that everybody don't feel anymore this obstacle that they cannot go wherever they want to go. So if you look at that context that you can be wherever you want to be in EU, this is really good. And then um, I read some study and they said like that actually the migration between the inner EU is very acceptable, it's much more acceptable than the migration coming to EU. So your neighbor from, the, from Germany, like I'm Polish, so my neighbor from Germany would rather accept me than somebody coming from the third country. But this is also very limiting in a way, I would say, because it changes. So right now when you, when you have a constant information flow that people don't like other people coming, for example, from Romania in UK or Pol Polish in UK, or the, there was an example of uh, France and Spaniards, you, you kind of consider like, well, but we should be equal, but we are not. Why I should go to the country that, won't ac that is already rejecting me before I'm even there? So, so this also creates this maybe a little bit discussion about the identity and then you clinch to your national identity because you feel emotionally more attached to it and you feel proud of who you are and then you feel in opposition to people who are attacking you who don't even know you. So, so this creates this all additional why would you like to leave and why would you go to the country that may reject you because you are somebody mm -hmm. else. Yeah, and uh, just to confirm that if you look at uh, studies and you ask particularly young people what is the best thing about the European Union, usually the, the top answer is the freedom of movement. But like you say, we don't tend to think about where this comes from. It's like, it's there, right? You, you, you go on your Ryanair flight with your passport. If you're like me, you forget your passport and you write back from the airport. Uh, but you, you go there and you, I completely forgot that I need a passport to travel to another EU country. Uh, and then you can ask the people, okay, so if you move countries, what, what does this involve? So what, what do you think you need to do if you move countries? And they'll be like, you know, get an air ticket. And then you can, one way to steer the discussion is towards the question of what's there that makes it possible to do this movement, uh, which, uh, to link it a little bit to the other question, um, which the EU makes possible that without the EU wouldn't be there. Um, you know, I think there are two sides of that question. One side is th that, I mean, from the experience we have here, for example, in the group, most of us with an international background, we know that if you have an international experience, you're much more open to an international environment. So your prejudice goes down, your tolerance goes up. So if that question is asked, and now the answer is, I don't want to move. Yeah. What, what, you then, what are you actually then saying so that this person starts considering Wait a second, maybe I should move in order to better understand the advantages of the European Union. What, what, what would you say? What would you, how would you in 
tr in trigger maybe, the, the, yeah, the maybe the, the looking the for something which is about stimulating cultural curiosity. Um, I and I think maybe for this age group, maybe not so the work and live and move, but visit. So, for example, this year. Um, the commission launched a travel pass, like Eurail. Did anybody do that when they were kids? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so even though travel's cheap and it's facilitated, it still can be quite a challenge for some people. So maybe if you can get a free rail pass, thinking about how to stimulate and encourage young kids to go and experience different cultures is is the first step, isn't do it? Do you have some details on that decision with this uh, Yeah, travel so um, the, um, it was a competition, actually. So there was a certain number of... Uh, tickets available a lot. I couldn't tell you how many. Yeah, and you had to apply on thirty thousand. And it was the first year, so what they realised was that something that was possibly missing from the Erasmus exchanges was the cultural component. Mm -hmm. So enabling the kids who'd gone somewhere else to experience more deeply the culture of where they were, or perhaps to travel around within the neighbouring the neighbouring environment. So stimulating the cultural. You want to find a way to stimulate the question, which says. How how could you want to experience another culture or, you know, understand... We understand where we're from when we go somewhere else, and that can start with going to the next village and the next town, and that would also be very contextually driven. If you're in a Polish village or you're in London or you're in an economically privileged environment or uh, a small... You know, there's very the barriers are not just um, regulatory. Mm -hmm. I have a comment on this. Um, what we were discussing uh, in, in the group before to come up with the question is uh, w we had the idea of uh, talking about travel. We decided to uh, choose for a living because it has more implication and the idea was to uh, raise the awareness that Europe is not just about you can go somewhere and travel. There's something more. You can actually can mean uh, a totally different life for someone go live abroad um, and, and that links to what you were saying that um, that a lot of people take it for granted that they can travel so this is already uh, acquired people already know they can travel wherever and uh, well our, our impression was that they were not really aware yet that they could actually go and live somewhere or they wouldn't think of it and so th this is why we, we decided to go more towards the living than the traveling. Okay, thank you for the explanation. And I think uh, with that, we would close that first question. Any further comments? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go for me, but... Uh, no, but, but I'm glad... It's, it's I'm glad, glad to um, <coughs> one point, there will always be people. They say, well, no, I want to stay in my village. I love my village. I do not have this cultural curiosity. And I think the mistake we are making is we are trying to force that e European model onto them. But if we say that's fine, in the Europe of today, you can make that choice. But what if I were to ask you if people around you would have that um, uh, cultural um, uh, curiosity, if they would like to uh, travel, if it would make them happy, would you, with your choice, forbid them to go? Because we don't want to force that model onto you. It's a matter of freedom. Can you choose? You're free to choose. You're free to choose where to stay wherever you want. But who are you? Do you think it is wise, from a community sense, from a cultural identity sense, to not give others? who would like to do that, eh, to not give others this, this opportunity. So, and does it, if they take that opportunity, does it harm you? And s if so, in what way? And then the point comes, and I don't like them to go, they have to stay here because this is my model and they have to share my model. And then it's about democracy and about freedom and about happiness and welfare. That's the point. I think we, we, we're a privileged generation. If we like, if we think we can force our way of life onto others who do not want to do that, we are making a big mistake because it will increase fear and it will increase resistance. Mm. And yes, those people can live in Europe. Nobody says they can't. But please let the others who want to travel also live in Europe mm -hmm. and not in, in, in that kind of choice. You can, if you choose to live very conservatively, if you're against abortion, whatever, you don't have to 
choose for abortion if you want to, but others have the right to do so. It's about you and the others. So keep your choice, but who are you to limit the choices of others? I think that is an essential question. Who taps on my shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> I want to get out of here. Do <laughs> you want to respond to that? Yeah, and I, I wanted to put the other hat on for a moment um, because um, I think we spend a lot of our working life uh, talking about uh, the value of, inter, of in intranational cooperation and how enriching that is. I think it'd be interesting to dig out some statistics. I think that less than 10% of the European population are permanent migrants. And actually, I'm not in favour of permanent migration because it's actually very fracturing for families and communities. And it's one thing to go and have an ex study experience or to choose as an, e as an expat. Um, you know, I experience what that's like to be away from my extended family, for example, and I'm not so far away. Uh, it's, it's difficult to manage, um, and I think actually communities thrive. Um, but I am a passionate advocate of bringing in new ideas mm. and bringing in openness and, and tolerance, and I think that that's achieved in one way through travel. It can also be achieved through reading okay. broad, broadly. You know, so it's, it's about the curiosity and openness to the other, and travel's one way that you achieve that. You don't have to stay there. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, the tap on the shoulder will come from the second question. So, um, we wanted to ask, and to, um, we talked, uh, you already mentioned the freedom of movement as one of the benefits in the EU, and we take it for granted, but we also wanted to spark the question, the, this really simple question, uh, what is for you personally the benefit of the European Union? So for me personally, it's uh, I think this concept of the open society and that everybody can go and be whoever they want to be and there is really no limitation on that and that lures a little bit to, to what was said. I come from the very li a liberal background and the European Union cultivates this kind of way of living that it's, uh, you know, you can be uh, Pol and Polish people living in Belgium, you, have, you can have right, okay, you have a right to choose, you have a right to speak multiple languages, nobody can, you can visit different country. But this is one of the concepts. It's, uh, there's much more, but it's also my view what Europe gives me, but it also is, so my perception is I'm better with Europe, but the perception of other people is they worse with Europe. Although that might be just the perception, but it's so difficult to, to, to fight with the perception because the whole globalization, the whole movements around it also cause so much uncertainties. So I am good in a swimming between what I want to take and taking the best, but a lot of people take the worst. They take the uncertainty, they take that the communities are being crushed, they take that jobs are being sacked somewhere, that 200 people are leaving one country every month for, for another country. Those are the things that on the, on the national and community level become very big problems. For me, I believe in the project, I believe it gives the freedom. I came from the, I was born in the communist country. It is a different mentality that I, for me it is better. For, but for my sister, she doesn't remember. She's like, oh, it's normal. So, so how do we actually bridge the, the, the expectation and so, you know, what, what we can bring for the future? Just to follow up on this, on a, on a practical note, I think it's actually it's a, it's a good open-ended question because people would have some ideas. Usually they'll be very influenced by what's in the news. So uh, you ask them what, what's the EU for you and usually the, the answers are likely to be something that was in the news over the past couple of months, something that's being discussed at home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then you can get a little bit of a feeling about what's the level of, uh, of knowledge of understanding. So it's a very good question to to start off with, but I think you need to keep building up on this in order to get a discussion going and obviously the classic question here is what are the good things that you brings to you, but the interesting question I think is you can be slightly provocative and uh, depending on your audience and ask what, what are the bad things about Europe uh, and, uh, and then take the discussion in that way because I think that will be more engaging than, uh, uh, than rehearsing what's a list that people keep hearing uh, all the time and I think there will be a, a nice way to play devil's advocate a little bit with uh, with uh, the people and actually get a little bit of a discussion going or maybe it's just my Anglo-Saxon education coming through. <laughs> well maybe let me 
challenge you on that uh, uh, formulation, I'm not necessarily a challenge or build on it. Um, we had in one of our talk shows before actually a discussion that led to the understanding that there is not really a European news media, there are only national news media. So you w the, you the news you get about Europe are actually coming through your national medias, which are definitely tainted by the national understanding of Europe. Uh, we had, uh, when we talked in Barcelona about Catalonia, a gentleman was there who came from Scotland. And he said what he re read in the Scottish news about Catalonia was very different than what you read in London about it, right? Uh, or in other countries, because it is the environment in which the news is playing uh, a role that defines the message. So how do we actually get to even uh, a common understanding about benefits of the European Union? Well, I'm British. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think it's not that it's not a good question. I think it would be really interesting to think about how to to dig down. I mean, we've been overwhelmed with what has the EU done for you? There's currently you can look in your postcode and see. Well, did it b build a road? Did it? It's not. That's not the hearts and minds conversation. Um, and it starts to get very technocratic. So. Um, when I started uh, this project, I, the funder said, oh, but you know, like 50% um, of national legislation comes from European Union. And I was like, yeah, but it's not in things that people notice. It's water, drinking water. It's, it's a lot of, you know, sort of background regulatory quality stuff that we, that we take for granted. Um, so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure where that conversation goes. And also from our perspective, I just start to think very technically and bureaucratically about EU legislation. I'm trying to think what 16 and 17 year olds. And and again, we we we're, we're crossing over Europe and the EU quite a lot, maybe. So. And but that's also, I think, the daring thing about this question is: it are they actually interested in this, and does it actually spark a discussion about what the EU is actually for them? And I think that's also where we kind of wanted to go. And I mean, it's a bit. I would say far-fetched, but in the end, I mean, if we think about what, uh, what what happened in 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 Great Britain, in the UK, and what they are a lot of times talking about is really that young people don't vote about what matters. I mean, the EU is is a concept that will actually have an influence on their future a lot, and and if you uh, in in the end, such a question is really about sparking uh, interest. I think. It's probably exactly what you're saying. It's not uh, that uh, it can get very uh, technocratic, but yeah. Actually, because you mentioned that, and I want to just check, do we have some um, knowledge here about the participation of young people in the recent votings that took place in Europe? European elections. I actually uh, check this on the way here. I think in the 2014 election, the, the under 34 uh, participated at around 28%. So 28% turnout compared to 52% turnout for over 55. Uh, and I mean, that's mirrored in national elections, but obviously European elections have lower turnout than but national global elections. Global turnout in EU elections is low anyway, right? Yeah. Right. But the point is they spread between the the age difference. And actually, it was actually a bigger study, so the gender difference was not so huge. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there were socioeconomic differences, but mm -hmm. uh, probably the biggest uh, biggest variable in the turnout was actually age. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the one that explained the most of the turnout difference. So uh, it's yeah, okay. it's going to be uh, quite important next year. So. No, so for the question, I think it's also good that you kind of take an ex aspect if the people are actually consider themselves an active participant of the of the political life of the European Union or just they very passive they kind of expect something from the European like the good stuff because that means something and they are super disillusioned because uh, they don't get what they want but they still don't want to go vote they still don't want to do anything about it they just like to express their discontent by you know commenting online that speaks to that national bias in media. So if I was a young person in Hungary right now, then I might have a different perspective and I might, I might be frustrated at what the European Union is or is not doing with Hungary, but I might have so much disinformation put in front of me that um, I would not understand the role that the EU could play. 
And what's really at stake in the next European elections is a shift to the fur further right in, in the legislature, which is not going to help the situation in Hungary or in Poland at all. Is, is it fair to say that uh, um, with young people you get a vote that is more balanced towards, um, uh, sh maybe I shouldn't try to make an assumption on which direction young people would vote, but uh, the, um, to, to bring the people in there uh, or motivate them to go to vote because there is a certain risk of a, of a movement to one tendency which maybe more represents the interest of an older age group. Is that something that is worthwhile to, to stir up, to, to that we go use this actually in classrooms as statements? Would you say you actually um, maybe scare or, or shy them away? Or can you, do you think that is a way to maybe motivate them to go to the polls? I don't know if that's going to come up in, a, in another group. We talked about it in terms of what the timing will be for these questions and that it could be slightly unfair to talk to 16 and 17 year olds about a vote that's happening in May next year that they can't vote in. Yeah, so actually, <laughs> wait, 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 actually, actually. Well, so we, want, we thought it would be useful to know which countries you would be in where 17 year olds could vote. Otherwise, you're kind of dangling something in front of them, and it's another five years before you can vote. But see, we have the chance to actually position this video with the questions uh, now to the group saying, go first to the 18-year-olds. Oh, yeah. I mean, that could be, I mean, because you always make a first attempt. Yeah. So actually, that's what I thought when you, when you were mentioning the numbers. I mean, it would certainly be interesting. Can we actually trigger a, a few people yeah. more going to the vote? And how do you actually do that? How do you, now you know you, you can vote. You're 18, or maybe you're 17 in some countries. So do you have some experience how you make young people actually gain, gaining an interest and go and vote? Just to say that another thing which comes from the statistics is that unlike the older generations, the young people tend to decide very, very late whether to vote or not, usually the week before. And then, that, and then uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, when you ask people why you didn't vote, the older generation said, I don't trust politics, etc. Uh, the students in the, in the sample said, I was too busy. Um, so uh, I was kind of less for political and more for behavioral tweak is to get them to think about, you know, put this into your diary, make a note, uh, know that this is the day, don't plan a day out or whatever. Uh, and uh, I think a, a behavioral start would already be good because you don't have this routine of voting in elections and thinking about voting in elections that you hopefully develop later on. Uh, in you said you're from Britain, uh, so uh, when I remember the Brexit vote correctly, yeah. then there was also the, sa uh, the same distinction. You know, the participation of the young people was a lot less than mm -hmm. of the elder people. Mm -hmm. And there was this one headline saying, the old people decided for the future of those who didn't vote. Yeah. Yeah? Um, is that a way to get the, get the people out there? Well, I, I think that it's, it's very interesting because the European Union is such a technocratic and such an abstract concept that people don't put any emotion into that. You put emotion to your national kind of perspectives. Mm -hmm. So, and people vote against something. So I think the best way to motivate people to, to make them stand against something. People don't go and vote for European Union. People can go vote against certain trends that are happening in their countries, but they're not going to, yeah, European, let's go, fine. Mm -hmm. I'm super happy. So I think telling that, oh, you're going to vote against your grandma, that was the rhetoric that was used in Poland, didn't really work, <laughs> so <laughs> I have to tell you that, no, you, don't, you cannot grow, vote against grandma, but you have to find something that is emotionally appealing to young people, one they would like to stand for something maybe different than what is happening right now. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll play a little bit of devil's advocate here because, uh, again, it's political science coming through uh, from my past uh, where I remember that most of the European elections actually people, and coming back to the point about news media being national, most people vote on national lines because, well, you have European parties, but your local EPP or S&D or Alde or whatever party is usually much more in your in your mind when when you're a voter and it's the you know the politics of the day in your country that tends to drive this uh, more than European issues even though there is um, more and more attempt to have more European issues uh, so in that sense I don't I don't necessarily think the European elections are 
different in terms of stimulating turnout than other elections. Uh, it's the same same tools, and I'll be I'll be wary of uh, like you're saying of fostering this idea that your right to your future is under siege, and that's why you need to go on. Because mm. I think particularly in the current generation of uh, say 18 to 21, you do see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of very different political opinions, which can go uh, very different ways. And I don't think this. We, it's like you've started off saying, we, we shouldn't assume which way uh, people are voting. And I don't think this confrontational rhetoric is really the way to get them out. Because I don't, it's generally a more, uh, it's more about the duty to vote, which is not there as an understanding. Uh, and uh, the understanding that there's something at stake, we, uh, which is a larger point about voting in general. Because if you're not, I don't think there are a lot of people who would vote in European elections, but not in national elections or vice versa. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Okay. Cameron, I'm sure you want to have the microphone now. <laughs> so um, my question, like what came up to mind when you were talking is that I feel that when I'm 25 and I even feel it sometimes that again, since the information we get is from our media, like our local media, uh, we don't really know where to look. And I think about this 16, 17, year, seven, 18 year old people who probably haven't even started reading the newspaper. Like they hear what their parents say, they may grab a newspaper, uh, but they have this doubt whether should they just directly believe what the newspaper says or not. So, or again, if they go to the European U Union webpage, should they just believe it? Because again, they're just gonna have one side. So where would you recommend they look for this information to decide on the boat? <laughs> Nine gag. <laughs> Definitely not Twitter. My, my kids get 80% of their political opinions from 9gag, you know, and it's like, oh my god, it's like 50% disinformation. Modern, I mean, but isn't that what Obama revolutionized, is like using social media creatively, um, thinking about ways of encouraging young people to fact check, um, you know, but that's a whole culture of civics, which is... Um, really really challenged in our modern times and also it sounds so banal but you know there's a loss of trust in the political system there's a loss of trust in the process there's a loss of, uh, even even myself i'm not sure i really think it's going to make i'm not sure how much my vote counts I, maybe i'd like to express myself politically differently through direct activism for example mm -hmm. and i've lost interest in that and it's hard to make a case that the eu really directs directly affects you or you. I mean, for me, yeah, right now, it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Carmen, for the question. Um, with that, uh, I would like to move on uh, to the third, actually to the fourth question, because I think due to the nature of the third question, how it was posed, I think it makes sense to discuss it uh, maybe at the end. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so I would like to uh, come, uh, sorry, say your name again. Jurek, come forward. Um, here's the microphone, yeah. and here's your question. Thank you. So then uh, our question that we came up with to, to ask you is, how would your uh, life look like if there was no EU? I think it's a very good question, actually, how your life would look without EU, because then we're forcing people to, to be a little bit more creative and to take a little bit more um, the, the, the more critical view of what they have and the, what they take for granted and what not may not be there if uh, if it if it just collapses because right now i feel that everybody's like oh i have this the, but then we have so many ridiculous things that the european union is not giving us yet so um, but if we already take everything that they gave us the european union gave us that may actually say like oh well actually maybe i should stop a little bit in the criticism so mm -hmm. I, I would say that the question is actually well formulated I love this. I love this question. I was in this discussion <laughs> a little bit, um, and it reminds me. I think it was um, Kofi Annan who died recently, who said, "If the UN didn't exist, we'd have to create it." And I think what we have now is an institution that we know has many failings and doesn't work very well. And I was trying to think, because of course, in a way, Brexit pushes you to ask that. Well, what what does it feel like if I'm not in the EU? Okay, and the pro Brexit camp says we can negotiate all this. Everything that the EU brings you will do anyway. It's fine. It's not like we're suddenly going to become a 
you know, non-democratic, um, dirty drinking water, you know, it's, it, everything will carry on just as it was before. We'll negotiate all the trade agreements, we'll carry on track, it'll be fine. And so it's quite interesting to think about how, how 28 countries would organise themselves if there were no structure to help them organise themselves. And I bumped on something you said there as well, thinking it's, it starts to get you thinking, not what will it do for me, but how can I make it work better? Because I think there's a, there was a lot of empathy and sympathy for the Brexit vote um, because the EU doesn't work very well a lot of the time and it is irrelevant a lot of the time. So the question might be how to make it more relevant for us now that we don't have the massive post-war driver anymore. This generation is not thinking about the war. It's, not, it's, it's all there. So like you say, you're in the threat thing. Are we going to lose everything? Oh, let's think about that. But what do, what do we, we want to build together? That, that's... That, that, that's what comes to my mind. Thank you for that answer so far, and I think that's the view that we all have, but I'm wondering, because I think that's what we are here for as well, is to see what answers can we give to people who are more critical about the European Union there, and if there's somebody going up to you telling you what do I have from the EU and telling you, you know, the main thing that I have from the EU is not a job because of authority measures, how do I go there and answer? I, I think you don't have to give them answer, you have to ask the questions. And you have to lead the conversation through asking questions. Because I would hate if I was skeptical about something and somebody told me, like, relax, <laughs> you know, this is all the answers. But if you kind of ask the question, then you're kind of learning about where the real problem is, and then you can start addressing it. But yeah, I would not look for an answer. You know, I would ask myself, first of all, what a 16-year-old, 17-year-old actually already knows is a benefit he has from the EU. What, is, will, he, what will he actually be missing if the EU would not be there? Does he actually, can he differentiate? Does he understand what his, wh where his life will be different without the EU? Do you understand that? You think? Yeah, and that's that's uh, why it's the risk in this question. It's a little bit abstract because of this idea that the EU is there and it's always there and it's just just how it is. Well, until it isn't. Uh, but uh, the, the one interesting angle to go into this, I can see two two ways to tackle this. One is to go local and to think about uh, go on that website uh, type uh, the postcode see what's around which is uh, uh, EU fund which doesn't need to be just so roads. So can, can I, can I so you, you mentioned it before so there is a chance that you can check in your direct environment no, what has been fine? Uh, it might be yeah uh, the it might be more centralized it might be done as a separate website which pulls the information for the UK but the information is there you might need to go through the <laughs> European Commission websites I'm afraid uh, okay <laughs> we told you apologies <laughs> please sorry um, continue but uh, no, sorry so one way is to go local the other way is to go counterfactual the other way is to think uh, to remove the names from the concepts which are there to remove the uh, the rhetoric of was there to say okay let's imagine you have two countries and you've just had a big war and you ask them, so what, what, what do you need for war? And they're like, you know, tanks. Okay, so what do you need for tanks? And, you know, what do you need? Steel. Okay, so if you want to make sure the two countries don't fight, what do you do, et cetera, et cetera. And then you build up the narrative and they say, well, you, you know, actually, you know, there was 1952, 1953, et cetera. And you, you then bring in the example. And that way, we come back to this idea, they understand a little bit the logic of, uh, of, uh, of how we got here rather than just the snapshot of where we are today. Uh, but sorry, I interrupted you. No, I have not interrupted you, and I think that's a very good idea to go there. Like, have the students build up the European Union basically by themselves, uh, with going one fr from one idea to the other. Though, on the other hand, I see that's not really the question that was posed uh, by the group, which is like, how does the European Union impact your life in a positive way currently? And um, well, the critical thing would be that p students don't have an answer to that. And I think that you're wrong to tell them, oh, but there was this road and it was paid for by the European Union, because you yourself on the panel said it's about, it's about the emotions that are connected to the European Union. It's not about the factual things. So how do we make a sure that people have a more emotional connection to that? You can ask them, do you like feta cheese? 
if they, for example, in Germany, because the, the produce that are kind of, uh, you know, all the food products, we have this food security policy that is going to different countries when you can, trans uh, you know, transport and sell the produce from different countries. Or, for example, in Poland would be, do you only like eating apples in the, in the fall? which is also very nice and sustainable, but not may, a lot of people may not actually like the oranges that are coming from Spain. And it's, so, so yes, I think this is all about questions and how, how you frame the debate in what actually appeals to people. I would go very careful with tanks. I think tanks are really <laughs> appealing right now. <laughs> so. um, what occurred to me also when you were saying about um, what if some, somebody says, well, it's because of austeri EU austerity, that's an example of misinformation and it's a, an example of poor understanding of the EU political processes as well so that's that that could also lead them down an encouragement to look at facts more critically because um, I would argue that the Brexit referendum was lost due to misinformation about the role that the EU had in Euro in UK decision making so for example um, EU immigration law requires that after three months, or allows a member state after three months, to require a newly arrived um, migrant to have uh, the means to sustain themselves. Otherwise, they can be asked to leave. The UK is the one country that has not enforced that rule ever. Um, you know, and we know anecdotally, anecdotally that after the referendum, the next day, the most Googled question was, "What is the EU?" <laughs> You know, so uh, it's true. You know, so you could, if, if you get that kind of response, you could sort of start to say, why do you think that, I mean, if we're in Greece, for example, that might be a complicated question in terms of what the role of the national government was versus the role of the European Union. But it's, it's, it's not the EU imposing entirely on a national state. And that's, that's a misinformation about understanding the power and the role of the EU in national or local experiences. So you could, you could encourage them to be critical in their information search. Hello. Do you remember your question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we wanted to ask high school students um, which development they would like to see in their communities and in their personal life and kind of to take this as a point to initiate discussion on um, which role the European Union plays in, um, yeah, helping them uh, build these dreams? I love that. I just love. I love this question. I think to go to the previous question, how what you're planning to do is just fantastic, and it can be quite intimate and can be quite personal. And I think bringing it down to a really personal question. It, it may be more about stimulating a sense of responsibility that you know political structures have, have an Im impact on one's own life. But I think that's the way you change hearts and minds is by entering into this kind of close dialogue that's very, very personal. So maybe they can't immediately find a connection. So thinking about the follow-on follow -on questions, I think freedom of movement's a, a bit of a challenging one sometimes, isn't it? Because we're offering them a potential of something they may not even know they want right now. Um, but thinking, what, what is it that you're really, really dreaming of? How, how could that be enabled by person in your community, by engaging, making it real for you? That's, I just love that. I think it's super. Um, I agree. I, I like this question <coughs> a lot. I think because the real change can only come from the like a very uh, local level mm -hmm. and it can be built to, to something bigger as a political movement of political change that is mm -hmm. coming. And I think that when you ask people at the local level what they care about, they're going to be very sincere because they said, oh, we need more roads, we need more schools, we need more, so oh, I want to do something like this. And then you can ask a question like, who can help you with that? And then you can kind of stimulate the discussion of, of what could be done. But, but I like this kind of growing from the very local perspective and trying to, to shift it to, to the more like uh, abstract international. And my, my, I don't know, you, some of you have been 16 or 17 more recently than me, but um, it's not nine or 10 year olds anymore. And perhaps it's also an age when life can be quite hard sometimes. And in reigniting that dream that dream moment as well. Maybe they're feeling a bit weighed down by adolescence or exams or, you know, something that could enable, you know, just open up another moment of thinking, thinking big again. You ask, they're not going to be saying, I want to be an astronaut anymore when they're nine, y you know. 
You know, I think uh, one of the, um, the key reasons why we wanted to do that is actually that uh, um, I guess we all know that no person is born a nationalist, uh, uh, a sexist, or a racist. Yeah? You all become that by the influences you get through your upbringing. And maybe the age of 16, 17, 18, you're not yet done with that opinion building. And maybe we have a chance to plant a seed uh, that g gives a more positive perspective to Europe and to uh, intercultural uh, relationships, to uh, tolerance, and to, yeah, to open your minds for, for, for the values of Europe. The question is only, can we guide those um, people in uh, with, with questions to start the thinking process and where do they go afterwards? How can we, you know, because we all know just, you know, w when you water a flower once, that's, that's not going to do it, you know, you need to do it continuously until the, or the seed until something comes out of it. So what comes next? I would like to connect to this a bit as well as what you said earlier. Um, we're talking a lot about this freedom of movement. Um, however, I believe that uh, people who are looking for freedom of movement, who desire to travel, are usually not the ones who don't see benefit of the European Union, because this is a very obvious one. Um, so how do we build this perspective in people who want to stay in their local communities, who value their local communities, and um, which perspective can we give them that the European Union helps them to develop this personal life that they want to have to develop this community they want to live in? I think um, the power of, like, people need to feel empowered that they can change something. I think the, the most is the disillusion that the politician tell you something and they do something and you cannot really influence anything anymore because uh, you are disillusioned with politics, you dis disillusioned with the parties, you disillusioned with the programs. And um, I just want to give an example because I recently uh, somebody talked about one of the communities somewhere in UK mm -hmm. that they were really against bringing migrants. They, they because they were empowered, empower, like the, the, the community was not really uh, rich, they, they didn't have a lot of money, so the government said like, no, but we said we're going to bring you 300 people that are going to locate it there, you, that, that's the right. And the, the one of the MPs said, like, no, let's change a little bit the, uh, the lens. Let's, let's, let's ask them. Let's ask them. Let's have an open debate of what they actually want. And after two hours debate, all those people agreed that it's actually a good idea to, to accept those people. But if there was only something that was giving them top down, it would never have the same effect. They would be just so I, uh, very disillusioned. So I think that's, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to give back power to people that they can change something by the vote, by engagement, by, by the way that, that they tackling certain problems and, and just build from that. And the, the other reason why I like this question, like you said, is that it, uh, it's actually, it's not obviously a EU question, but it goes in that direction. And uh, the question actually for me is, it's a larger one about how we work together, etc. And then you can bring in the EU into the discussion about as not as uh, as a high level concept that it's out there but if you want to achieve this then uh, what sort of cooperation what sort of working <laughs> together do you need or maybe you know uh, this thing you want to build they already may have it in I don't know Spain or Poland so uh, <laughs> you can that and there you can draw in a little bit this idea of uh, let's draw let's draw in the lessons of other countries or let's work together because it's uh, it's uh, it's better to have uh, various points of view, so it's more efficient, etc. I think that's interesting because that connects to another idea of Europe, which is uh, uh, that for Europe as facilitator, as something that helps you achieve what you want to achieve. Coming to the point of uh, being going forward and <coughs> doing things by yourself and not being told what to do. Uh, so Europe as an enabler, if you want, as a platform for cooperation, which is uh, not something that you see every day out there, but uh, most of the times in most of the directorates of the commission or uh, in our place it's often this idea of bringing together and making sure things uh, uh, can be done together um, better than, than separately. First, first comment when observing this is I think we're assuming a lot. 
So we are assuming that everybody knows when you talk the EU, the EU, EU, that everybody knows exactly what you mean. It's an abstract thing. And what is, what is your view, view on that? I'm not sure we should start with that, but at some point, I think, in the dialogue, we should also talk about what is the EU. And you have the whole bureaucratic system, and it's, and it's, not, it's there for a reason. Right, so we didn't build this whole structure with all these people in the Euro par European par Parliament and European Commissions, not just to have freedom of movement. I mean, it's just one thing. Huh? So another question that actually links to the first talk show we did when we were exploring and came out at the end with this question which we didn't answer yet, but I would like to pose it here to you and see what your answer would be is, why does the EU exist? What is the purpose of the European Union? And this links to your point. We need to more uh, link to the emotions of people, something that you can feel proud of, something that you feel connected to, something that has meaning, instead of talking about, yeah, we have a European Parliament, we have elections. It's, it's, this is another level of uh, communicating. And like in a company or in any other organizations, you want to really connect with people, with their motivation, and with who they are. And how can we answer such a question? Why does the EU exist? What is the purpose of this EU and having this whole structure in place? <laughs> <laughs> this is the easy question. <laughs> yeah. I think um, we have, well, I understand that what you are doing already, you kind of, the people are pre-briefed of the, of the concept of the EU. But I also agree that we need to consider more the values that EU brings. We don't talk about the values enough. And we can say like, oh, the values are in the treaties. Great, but it doesn't really mean anything to the person on the ground. So we have to also redefine what we mean by the European values, what that not to make them too exclusive and too, uh, too ambitious, but that they actually appeal to the, to the emotions of people. And I, I like the word emotions. I work for NGOs, so it's like, you know, so it all goes in the, in the thing. But I really think that you can only build something if there is a strong emotional connection to, to the project. That's an impossible question. And I mean, uh, I'm coming from the cultural back sector, so it's something that's discussed all the time. And obviously, there's no one answer. The question might be, what, what is it for you? What is it for you? And I don't know you're a political scientist, but, it, but it, you know, th this is a big abstract and ideological question as well, is that the driver for the EU being created has been lost to some extent, you know, it, it generationally. So the question is, um, the qu I, I'm not even sure if the EU has to exist in its current form anymore. And I'm not sure that that's really a useful question anymore. I think, I think I'm going to go back to that UN thing. We live in a globalised world. Um, we're a relatively small territory. If you look at geopolitical balance, you've got the US, you've got China and Asia, you've got Europe. Um, we're like you were saying, after the Second World War, you know, we've, we've ended up with nation states with the boundaries that we have right now. Um, we cannot have the EU, as the EU member states as they are now, some of which comprising extremely small countries of only several, several million populations. We have to work together and we need tools to work together. That, for me, that, that's the answer. I, I'm not sure that's a hearts and minds answer for a 16-year-old. Uh, that's an adult response. So the, so the question, you know, I was, I was fascinated by that timeline, thinking how long before direct elections came in? You know, is that fulfilling a function in terms of de democratic participation? Um, and then I start to think about civilization arguments. You know, what's, what direction are we going in, you know, um, in the last hundred years? Um, oh, a hundred years ago, there was no EU country where women had the vote. Not one, you know. So we're talking about a progress of our continent, and yeah. And if you, if you take this even further, um, I mean, how long ago it Germany was just a set of little lender, yeah. Yeah. So so we moved on, right? Yeah. So we moved from villages to that 
to that. Uh, yeah. and, and EU is a logical next step. But why is it important? So what gets lost if you don't have this? And one of the topics that I haven't heard here yet, but I think that are in the hearts of 16, 17, 18 year olds, is something like sustainability, or taking care of the climate, or taking care of some of the big issues that are ahead. And how can we look at solving any of that if we don't collaborate? And you need to organize this collaboration, but it's just, yeah. Um, it's just, I think these kind of topics may more uh, be on the hearts and the minds of people as well that are in the classroom. But I would look like to hear you. Yeah. No, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's where this idea of the US and enabler as a platform for cooperation, I think, is, is quite useful. And, uh, and here, is, that's where I think it's better to start off with a more general discussion about how you solve this problem and there you come to the point that if, if the EU didn't exist, if that platform didn't exist, then, then you need it. Uh, but uh, then I think it would be uh, not ideal to try to come up with uh, one answer of what the EU is, a little bit on where, where you started your answer. And uh, people have different views and you can have different views that lead to the same conclusion or different views that lead to completely different conclusions. I think that's part of the essence of the EU is that uh, it's not something that you, you, you get there and you can pin down. But at the same time, it's not exclusive. And uh, again, so sorry for being the number guy. But uh, if you look at, uh, if you ask people uh, about, uh, do you feel, so they, I think it, it's phrased interesting because they're like, th the question in the EU barometer is, do you feel your European. national identity and do you feel European? So it doesn't pose it as an exclusive difference and actually is I think for the under 26 it was 70 percent of people who say both yeah. uh, but then the the more you go up the age groups the more people tend to choose one or the other uh, so it's in so there is this idea of the EU being there but not being uh, not being one direction so this multi-speed Europe not necessarily going to the one direction altogether but being in this together uh, particularly in the globalized world but I won't go on numbers there because there are too many numbers but do, you, do we have an understanding why that's happening why the numbers separate as we go on why are young people so easily adapt uh, identify with both and then later on they lose that do we understand that how 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 many of you would say they're uh, they're f you feel your national identity Let, let's say Bulgarian, Polish. <coughs> okay, yeah. But interestingly, <laughs> not, not necessarily everybody, so that's interesting. Uh, and how many of you would say that you feel European? Yeah, that's called selection bias, people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, I think the, I don't know, I don't know that uh, the answer to this question, why we, why there is this division, but I think the interesting point is that now you have some people saying, I'm you know, I'm proud to be Bulgarian and I'm proud to be European. Uh, and I think that's indicative of the change that we're seeing at these levels that you, you spoke. So uh, not a very good answer, I'm afraid. But uh, no, thank you anyway. I mean, and what we said before, I don't think that's necessarily the, the way we are going right now. I mean, I, you, you may say that the national progress is that we all understand that the more collaboration makes us all being better, safer and more prosperous. But I don't see that being the, at least the short term trend right now. The short term trend is different. Right now we see more, yeah. more, more countries yeah. actually thinking that their response to the current challenges is a step back. Mm -hmm. Leaving treaties, leaving um, multinational corporations. And that is for me an interesting subject, especially again under the light that when you're young you seem to see that's more natural while, while you get older. That seems to be at least in the current situation being a more favorable choice. And that's, and why? Why people tend, as they progress in their life, feeling more threatened by multinational environments? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hypothesize, but I, I think it's an observed sociological trend that people tend to become more conservative as they get older. And I think that a lot of that's about um, acquisition of wealth and family you start to have something to protect and to lose um, when the stakes are higher when you're younger. So obviously it's not everybody. And you might stop moving around, you know, as we've, uh, as we've said, you know, moving around constantly for your whole life is actually a challenging lifestyle. So when you're young, when you don't have kids, when you don't have financial responsibilities, you know, the world might look very different than when you're 40. Um, you know, so I think that's, and, and there's also um, very interesting theories around um, 
uh, it, this had come up earlier, this question of community. How do you define your community and what your circle of responsibility is? So we might say, well, I'm going to go very far for my kids or my, f my immediate family or maybe my colleagues or maybe my extended family. But if I'm living in rural France, I'm not sure how much sacrifice I'm going to make for a Polish farmer, actually. I don't set, I just don't, that's way too far away for me and I don't really want to be paying into a social security system that they're going to benefit from, which is how the French could see things. So that, that kind of makes sense to me anyway. I, I already have. Uh, <coughs> I was actually thinking about that question for, for a long time and some, some things pop up during the discussion like just war, tanks, and I have the feeling that uh, being a believer in Europe is getting more difficult because the arguments are getting rusty. Mm -hmm. And they're... Rusty? Yeah. Um, th they don't work anymore. And maybe the challenge for Europe right now is to give an answer because people are getting older faster than Europe is growing. And mm, year after year, less people remember the war. Less people remember the consequences of war. Let people remember the reasons that uh, why Europe was founded, starting with this agreement about mines and steel. And over and over, just people get older, and all this is just memory. It's ancient history. It's difficult to involve people in Europe. We're just discussing about voting. And once you're believing in it, after you scratch a little bit, Maybe it's just an empty shell sometimes because you're expecting uh, more equality, uh, more, let's say, less differences between countries. It's interesting that, that you were mentioning, like, yeah, I was born in a communist country. And maybe it's also a responsibility to open a debate between 28 countries nowadays. Uh, what is our economic system, what is our, what are our models, what are our core values, and how are we fighting for them? And actually, sometimes um, I'm missing this. Some con I come from Spain, so we have problems sometimes with corruption, with independence, I'm from Barcelona as well. Uh, maybe some people are just missing this open <laughs> debate between everybody. So so we can bring solutions from other places. So we can bring, for example, development to certain areas of in Europe. Not, we don't need a full Europe with companies and industry and economic power, but certainly some areas are getting behind. You name the reasons, but maybe at this point it doesn't matter. And we're just to look forward instead to look backwards. Because every time we look backwards, this, these arguments we're, over, we're building, they're getting older and lose meaning. I, I guess it's a nice, uh, nice analogy to say they're getting rusty. Yeah. <laughs> because they were built of coal and steel yeah, and <laughs> a lot of water run down the Rhine these years. Okay, yeah. um, any comments to that? I think um, Europe right now is facing, not only Europe, I think the, the all liberal order is facing something that we were not really prepared. That uh, people are disengaged with politics, there is a huge movement of this nationalistic identity politics that is happening, and we don't know how to respond. We have this truth decade, post-truth world, and we are not ready, our democratic institutions are not ready to respond. Our politicians cannot respond in the same way that they were responding because nobody, there is no trust. So I think Europe is um, unfortunate a victim of a much European Union as a concept, much is a bigger much trend. bigger trend. And we see it very like detached from everything else and we discuss it as a European in here, but it, it's really all over. Yeah. So, so this is also like, we have to look in a bigger context, I think, when we address Europe. Mm. So regarding this, I was thinking on the analogy of the rusty thing, and that we were also talking on the on the hundred years level of yeah how how stuff would happen if the EU didn't exist, and I was thinking that well something like this already happened in Europe, and not going Godwin's law, but I'm going more into uh, 100 years ago. It was promised to Europeans that 
this would be the war to end all wars, we will be all friends again. And what happened was that politicians in the end didn't deliver. And problems continued happening and in the end, well, it happened what we all know. And in the same sense, I can see that a similar thing is happening again, that is that, so the Berlin Wall fell and all the people in the Eastern Bloc were promised like, this will be amazing, this will be really beautiful, we will all develop together, we will all be one European community. But what in the end happened was that politicians didn't deliver and what I can see happening is people take the charge in some way against the EU because in some sense I can take a charge against my own EU government, my own national government, sorry. I will vote for the next guy. But in a lot of countries what happens is what's the, how do I hold my, my European government, my, the European Commission accountable when I don't like what they are doing or stuff is not moving enough fast. So that would be my question to move this rusty thing regarding it. So as a citizen, what can I do to actually m help things move faster? And also what they you should change in itself so this, account this lack of, of accountability on that citizens feel doesn't happen. Yeah, and uh, that's I think that is that is the right question. And the first step towards this question is to think about who is accountable for what right now. Uh, and that's where it's interesting because we had this discussion so far, which is which was kind of what is the EU, what we would like the EU to be, uh, and uh, we're speaking about obviously freedom of movement, peace has been come up a couple of times, etc. You know, big concepts and important goals, but uh, what we haven't discussed is who is uh, in charge of what these days, and that's again probably a very good subject to discuss with the age group you're all going to be engaging with, because it's a well-known uh, well uh, behavior from political leaders to say that whatever good happens is because they did it, and whatever bad happens is because Brussels told them to do it. Um, and I've seen this in my country, and I think we've seen it in other countries as well. And the other thing is when we remember the EU, okay, there is this promise, what we say, the, you know, development, peace, security, etc. And then we say, okay, but how do we do this? Well, we do this by giving 1% of GDP, even less these days, to, uh, to the EU, uh, compared to more than 40 or 50% of GDP in certain countries of national spending. So it's this question of who is in charge is a good starting point for this conversation because when we often speak about the EU, we have these big ideas, big goals, but we don't necessarily go through the question of, uh, sorry for being technocratic, but the more technocratic question of how, how, what, do we, what are we preparing to, to do in order to achieve those goals? And uh, obviously, if you want peace, security, and development with, uh, at the price of a cup of tea per week, uh, uh, that's a bit tricky to deliver. Um, so, um, I, I know we might be going a bit over time, but I just wanted to add one last question, maybe, that um, how does it make you feel, because we have a group of around 30 uh, people here, coming from all across Europe, around, around 12 nationalities, and they have been working throughout the entire weekend to develop projects to uh, bring ourselves towards a more caring society. How does it make you feel that we've invited you here to talk to us and what, yeah, how does it make you feel, basically? Um, I'm just so grateful, and I feel very humble, actually. And I think, you know, we're, we're both working in NGOs, and so we, we're coming from an activist mindset. And I, I understand that the topic here is European unity and that we're talking about the EU as well, but um, I think... I think it's something much deeper than that, actually. And, and you, you, you know, we are living in a global, global world. The fact that you're reaching out and trying to connect with other people is the beginning. Um, and I think Europe, Europe is a progressive and liberal project, and I think that's the kind of world that I want to live in. And we do that by connecting with each other. Um, and I think it's great. I mean, you're all, you're all a bit old to be millennials, but, you know, young people don't get a good r a reputation sometimes, and it's a gift for me because I don't get to speak with groups of young people. I hate even saying that, young people, <laughs> you know. But it's, you know, it's, 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 it's fascinating, and, and I would argue that um, the, the, m the single biggest piece of value of going into these schools, if you can really mobilise people to do that, firstly, that's remarkable, and secondly, is just bearing witness, doing it. And what you're really asking these young people to do is to think and engage. 
And for me, it really doesn't matter if it's about the EU or if it's about something local. It's about putting your head up and looking around and asking yourself a question about how you're connected mm -hmm. in some way. And I think that the ambassadors that go in will by their, just by their nature provoke and be inspiring because they're coming from somewhere else. And that's, that's, that's the first little irritation, isn't it? So nothing but good can come from that. So I'm very thank grateful, you. thank you. Yeah. I also feel very privileged to be here and thank you for inviting me because wor working in Brussels, it's very detached from the real world. And also that you getting, uh, like you actually, your goal was to find the questions that you would like to ask to those people in the school is something that that's I find it fascinating because what we do, we give answers. From, from my, my position, I come with a recommendation, with answers, I have like, I'm like knowing all, kind of like, you know, I tell you what, what you do right and what you do wrong. So this actually opening the debate and connecting this big concept to, to the very personal, uh, individual level is it, something that, that I think will be very successful in, in, in st stimulating the debate. And absolutely the thinking and engagement bit that uh, you mentioned, I think that's absolutely crucial because that's, that's w if you think about how many times in the last hour and a half we've said, yes, but we have the national media, the national politicians, etc., etc. And the fact that we are here in Brussels, uh, but outside of the European quarters, which is good, uh, to, uh, to discuss this uh, and that we're, was it 12 nationalities you mentioned? Uh, and then that you go to a school and I gather most of you will be go to a place that you, you've studied or maybe uh, that you know from somewhere that you have a personal connection. I think that's exactly this value of coming together and then also uh, engaging people around these questions. And I think on a, on a personal level for me this is a great discussion because I, I mean I work for the Commission and uh, I spent my days thinking about directives and legislation and things like this. Uh, and I don't spend my days thinking well, sometimes I do actually, but uh, when I don't have that much work. Uh, but to uh, thinking about you know, why, why is this building here? Why is this director general here? What are we doing? And we have the technocratic answers, which is like, you know, the government's delegated in the treaties and their article, whichever. Uh, but uh, the, the question is like, okay, but, you know, why do people take photos with the European flag outside of outside of, uh, outside of the EU headquarters? And uh, and every time I see those pictures, every time I have these discussions, it's, it's quite heartening to, to see, even if we're not necessarily in the best of worlds right now, uh, the fact that we have those discussions is uh, making it a little bit better, which is what it's all about for me. So are you satisfied with those answers? Absolutely. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good. That actually you already asked more or less the closing question and uh, looking at the time, looking at uh, the long day we have had, maybe it's really about then also time to close. Um, I think the, uh, the question has proven to engage us very intensively for m more than an hour, as you uh, rightfully said, and uh, that we have seen quite a lot of people actually coming in shows that was not just only a matter of those four uh, people coming in the question, I guess a lot of people really have an opinion and, and have it in their heart, at least the group that sits here. And uh, I have to say, you proved your worth as experts. I really appreciate the discussion with you. You gave a lot of insight, including the number guy, which I think is really important as well. <laughs> so that was also very much appreciated. <laughs> so thank you very much for this very engaging discussion. Uh, we will promise we will make out of this uh, the best tutorial we can get for as many people as possible so that we can first of all incentivize them and give them the motivation to actually pick up the, uh, the PowerPoint, pick up the phone, call their schools, and make a first try and we all want to collect it back on our uh, Dialogue Monkeys website. How we want to do that exactly, we are still working on that. But we make sure we keep you in the loop and that you see what actually comes out of what we started today. Thank you very much and uh, have a great evening. <laughs>